Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship, to praise, to reflect on the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to think that a holy God would come and send his one and only son to rescue us from our sins in which we could not save ourselves, and that through faith and only in what Christ has done by dying on the cross and raising from the dead, through faith in him and him alone, we can be forgiven and given eternal life. That is good news that we will never get tired of praising you for. And we thank you for our church family, and I pray that this morning we will focus in and honor you through obedience, through um, being encouragement to one another, and help us, Lord, to live the gospel every day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing praise to the Lord.
looking together at verses 6 through 14. So if you uh, can find your place there, we're going to get to those verses here in just a little bit. So it has been uh, good to hear many of your testimonies over the last few weeks on Tuesday nights. I think there were some on Friday night that I wasn't able to hear. Uh, but good to hear your stories of how you came to know Christ as a Savior. And so we've enjoyed uh, hearing those together and Hopefully in a few weeks here we'll have our charter membership service and maybe recount some of those stories and celebrate together God's work in our lives. But as the, the outline says in your introduction, all Christians have a story, right? And everyone has a story, really. But we have a wonderful story to tell of God's work in our hearts and lives by His grace. And so I've written here, as people hear you share your story, do they walk away with a clear understanding of of Jesus. And uh, I wrote that because I've heard and listened to a lot of testimonies over the years. I've even given my own testimony over the years. And I think oftentimes when we share it with other believers, especially, we share our story knowing that they kind of know the story, right? And so we give the general details of uh, maybe when we uh, trusted Christ, but we don't really get into the details. You know what I mean? The difference? We share our experience, maybe of growing up in a Christian home and always, always in church. And so I just kind of gave my life to, to God. And uh, since then, everything's been wonderful. And, and that is the story. But the story links it to the, the details, the deep-seated, rooted, uh, fundamental theological truths of the story that are anchored in what Jesus has accomplished for us in the so for those who sat in some of the interviews, it really isn't an interview, right? It's just us sharing our stories. Uh, you've heard me ask in particular, you know, if, if I was to ask you, what is the gospel, what would you tell me? Right? And so it kind of takes everyone back a little bit. And I know that you know, but the gospel is the good news of Jesus, of his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the implications of that for those of us who are sinners, which is all of us, right? He is our Savior. And so those, those are the deeper truths of the story that we share. So uh, as it says here, as people hear you share your stories, uh, do they walk away with a clear understanding of Jesus? So in other words, as you retell your story, does it clearly communicate the story? So if you were to share your story with an unbeliever, would they be able to walk away knowing who Jesus is, knowing what Jesus has done, and how they too can trust him as Savior. Uh, that's an important part of our testimony, right? That others may hear and also receive him as Savior. So we come to our text today, and Paul, calling the Galatian believers to recall their own salvation experience, he hoped that they would remember, as Pastor Jason went through last time, that number one, salvation is not a reward for working hard, right? So it's not like I work hard and so God rewards me now with eternal life and forgiveness and you know eternity with him. It's not a reward for working hard, but a gift received by faith. And so Pastor Jason talked about that last time. He also talked about the fact that salvation is not a matter of uh, God demanding obedience from us, demanding for some performance from us, which in one sense he does, but he knows we can't do that. So he sent a Savior who could. And so it's not about us getting it all right, but rather it's about entering into a personal relationship with Jesus. So that was covered in verses 1 through 5 of Galatians chapter 3. So this is, this is the story. If in sharing our story, we are failing to fully understand and communicate these key elements of the story, then perhaps we become like the believers in Galatia who were theologically adrift. I use that term being from the East Coast. I think everyone can kind of understand what it means to be adrift. Uh, if your boat loses its mooring and the wind comes and it just kind of takes you, you know, wherever the wind will, right? Wherever the sea will take you. Um, we can be that way theologically, where we're adrift. We're, we're off in la-la land somewhere, uh, we're kind of losing that anchor to these deep-seated theological truths that, that really just... Uh, establish us firmly in our faith. And so as, as it relates to the gospel, the gospel truth, the story of Jesus, that's where we want to find our mooring. We're going to anchor ourselves there. Not just in an experience of, well, I grew up in church and kind of had an introduction to God and to Jesus and, 
just this nebulous story, which is the story, but the story itself. Jesus died for my sin, and he rose again, and apart from trusting in him, I would be eternally lost. We want to anchor ourselves deeply in that. Does that make sense? So this is where Paul goes in our text today, okay? Uh, to better anchor ourselves, let's talk a little bit more about the theology behind the story, this story, the gospel. This gospel is not new. Interesting what Paul does here is he takes these believers back to a child of God that they all knew very well. And his name is Abraham. He is the father of the Jewish nation. And we know Abraham from being in church and studying the scriptures, especially the Old Testament. You go back to Genesis chapter 12, and there is our first introduction to him as Abram, as God calls him and says, I want you to leave your land and go to a land that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to give you a children that will number as the sand of the sea, and through your seed, singular, there will be one through whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. Of course, we know that to be Jesus. And so uh, Paul takes them back to this man, Abraham, and no question in the Jewish mind that Abraham was a child of God, part of the family of God, those who are blessed by God. He was the father of the Jewish nation. And so uh, if, as Paul's Jewish opponents were suggesting, a person was saved not only by trusting in Jesus, but also by keeping the laws and traditions of Judaism as given through Moses, if that's how a person is truly saved, then let me ask you this. How was Abraham saved? Think timeline, right? Abraham lived long before Moses ever came on the scene. And so did his son Isaac. So how was Isaac saved? If Moses wasn't on the scene and the law hadn't been given yet, how was Isaac saved? How was Jacob saved? How were uh, Jacob's 12 sons saved? And then it goes on from there as the nation of Israel is established. Like how were these people saved if the law of Moses didn't even exist? This is the argument Paul's now bringing up. It's like, this is coming right to the heart of your understanding of how a person is reconciled to God. It strikes right at the heart of what you're saying. A person is reconciled to God by keeping the law of Moses and and following the established traditions of Judaism, well, none of that existed in Abraham's day. None of that existed in Isaac's day or Jacob's day or the early stages of the nation of Israel's day. So how were these people saved? He's going to answer this as we go through this. And what's going to emerge are some deep-seated theological truths uh, that they need to anchor themselves to as believers in Galatia, and we need to today as well. And so using Abraham's salvation experience as an example, uh, these theological truths emerge. The first is this. Righteousness has always been by faith, as opposed to works, right? Always been by faith. So Father Abraham, no stranger to the Jewish people, one author said this. In the Jewish literature of this time period, Abraham is invariably depicted as the hero of faith, whose fidelity and obedience merited the favor of God and brought divine blessing on him and his posterity. Okay? Listen carefully to what he's saying here. In the Jewish mind, they're saying Abraham had a blessed position and standing with God because of his fidelity, his loyalty to God, and his obedience. So because Abraham did what God told him to do, that's what put him in good standing with God, and, and thus merited God's favor. If Abraham had not done what God called him to do, then Abraham would have been out of God's graces. See? This was the Jewish understanding. So the Jews looked to two events in Abraham's life as evidence of his faithful obedience and his worthiness before God. Consider this summary of the life of Abraham from an apocryphal book, the book Syriac, okay, chapter 44, verses 19 through 21. If you're not sure what the apocrypha was, these are uh, Jewish writings between the Old and the New Testament uh, that were not considered canonical as in part of Scripture, 
but nonetheless they were reflecting the mindset of the Jewish people at that time. Okay, so again, this is more of their mindset. Listen to what uh, this Jewish author wrote. He wrote this. Great Abraham was the father of many nations. No one has ever been found to equal him in fame. He kept the law of the Most High. He entered into covenant with him, one, setting upon his body the mark of the covenant. You know what that was? Circumcision. He was circumcised. So this is what he did. He set upon himself his body the mark of the covenant, and when he was tested, he proved faithful. When was he tested? The biggest test of his life was Isaac. God called Abraham, but when you take your son, your only son Isaac, and, and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham took his son, had the knife in hand, and ready to drop it, right? So, Jewish mindset, because Abraham was circumcised, and because Abraham did what God told him in offering his son Isaac, well, thus then that merited God's favor upon him. This is the writings of, of, of the day, between the Testaments. So, the Jews considered Abraham worthy of God's blessing because he kept the then future law of Moses, circumcision, and he sacrificed his son Isaac. So the Orthodox Jew of Paul's day believed that the righteousness of Abraham came because of these works. And they would say, this is why he was saved. Because he obeyed God. He was rewarded for performing well. Paul's understanding, as we get into this text, of Abraham's salvation is interesting. He doesn't reference Genesis 17, where if we go back and read that, we see Abraham taking upon himself this mark of circumcision. We, he doesn't reference that. He doesn't reference Genesis 22, where if we went back and read that, we see record of him taking his son Isaac to offer him. He doesn't reference that. So these two uh, hallmarks of Abraham's uh, very devoted obedience. It's not like Paul pulls those in and say, yes, this is why Abraham was saved, that God showed his favor to him. He doesn't go there. Where he does go is Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. He quotes it in verse 10 of our text. Okay? Or I'm sorry, verse 6. So let's back up to verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you, Galatians, and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham, what? Believed God, and it, what? That belief, that faith, that is what counted to him as righteousness. It's a quote from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So if you think chronologically, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, before God ever mentioned circumcision and the requirement for, of that for his people, for, before God ever brought that up, before God ever said to Abraham, take your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice to me, before any of that ever happened, God is saying to Abraham, you are righteous before me. Well, that just blows holes in the Jewish argument, right? Well, Abraham was justified because he, he obeyed God in these ways. Paul says, before Abraham ever obeyed God in these ways, he was righteous. Why? Because he believed what God said. That was it. Was faith. So you see where Paul is going here. The average Jew of Paul's day believed that because they were the physical offspring of Abraham, they bore the same mark as Abraham, the circumcision because they kept the same commandments as Abraham, and that had proved their worth as Abraham did, then they too were literally and spiritually children of Abraham, and thus also the recipients of the promises made to him. They were blessed by God. Here, what Paul does, verses 7 through 9, he distinguishes that the true children of Abraham are not his children by any of these means of obedience. Rather, they are children of Abraham, spiritually speaking, because they demonstrated the same kind of faith as Abraham. They believed God. So verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are, let's, let's add commentary here, the real sons of Abraham, the spiritual sons of Abraham, those who are children of God along with Abraham. It is those who are of faith. 
and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. See what he's doing here? So God, long before Law of Moses comes on the scene, long before all the established traditions of Judaism come on the scene, and all the interpretations, and all the ways that, that the Pharisees and religious leaders say that everyone should live to be in right standing with God, long before that ever came on the scene, God is preaching to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to leave your land, I want you to go to a place that I will show you, I'm going to give you children like the sand of the sea, and in you, in you, Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed. All. Now that's that's in, inclusive, right? So not just you and your family and the nation that will come from you and your family, but all nations. He's already thinking Gentiles, right? Through your seed. And if you read the text, it is singular. Through a seed, one will come through him, all nations. He's preaching the gospel to him. He's talking about Jesus, right? And so Paul says to these Galatians who were kind of drifting because there were false teachers saying, well, to really be saved, okay, Jesus, but don't forget all these traditions and laws and, and all these established things of Judaism. Got to do all that too. Paul says, no, don't, don't, don't allow yourself to drift from what God preached to Abraham. He said, it is, and, and what was credited to Abraham as righteousness, it was his faith. Abraham believed. He believed what God had said. So Paul's point should have hit home very clearly for the Galatians. Abraham was saved the same way they were and the same way we are today, right? How are we saved? The same way Abraham was. We have a little more detail, a little more content, right? We know the full story of how this all came about. We know Jesus, we know the cross and resurrection and all of that. But at the same time, we, we believe it. We believe it. Abraham believed it was through a seed that I will be blessed. All right, God, I'm putting my faith and trust in what you said. God says, through the seed who came, Jesus, you will be blessed. We put our faith and trust in what God said. We're saved the same way. And this is Paul's point for those in Galatia. Long before the law ever came, Abraham believed what God said. And God, seeing that faith, credited righteousness to his account as a gift with grace. And so before Abraham was Jewish, think about that. God saved him. So uh, to the Jewish counterpart, you want to talk about being Jewish? There's a requirement for salvation. Well, you just excluded Abraham. <laughs> You're a hero of the faith. How foolish. God saved him, so why wouldn't he save the Galatians? Or us, for that matter, or anyone else, for that matter, right? And, you know, we don't, Judaism isn't a, a big thing for us in our culture, but, you know, before any of us were ever churchy, God saved us. So even as we share the gospel with those in our community, well, kind of got to be churchy to really be saved. You know what, long before we were churchy, God saved us. Think about that. None of this is a requirement for being right standing with God and living with Him for each other. Ever think about that? Now we do this because we love Him. And he's called us to do this, right? And so we, we, we love Him in this way and we worship Him in this way. We demonstrate our faith in this way. But none of this saves us. We're saved by faith. Right? That's how it's always been. And that's how it always will be. So, righteousness has always been by faith. There's another theo theological truth that emerges here. Uh, it's in verses 10 through 12. And it, it piggybacks on the other. It's more or less saying the same thing, but a different way. Justification has never been by works. So, Paul uh, continues his argument and returns to this idea of the Judaizers who claim that law-keeping was the basis for salvation. And he issues several statements here, quoting from Old Testament passages of Scripture to further strengthen his argument. So the first is in verse 10, where he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 27, 
verse 26. So verse 10, he says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. I think Old Testament history, book of Deuteronomy, this is uh, after the wilderness wanderings, so they're getting ready to enter the promised land for the second time, come up to the edge, right, ready to go in, and the law is issued again, and as the law is issued, the blessing comes through obedience. Right? You would obey me, you'll be blessed, you disobey me, you'll be cursed. It says here, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So, that's a setup for success, right? If someone came to you, well, we do this to our kids, right? If you sit still in church, <laughs> we'll go out for ice cream this afternoon. I mean, there's no greater incentive than that, right? Ice cream. Well, you just set them up to fail, right? They're sitting there, and they're wiggling, you know, and they're trying hard. It's impossible, right? It's impossible. And so we show them grace, right? We show them grace. Uh, this idea of keeping the law, like, it's impossible. It's impossible. And that's the point. You know, if we are relying on works of the law to be in right standing with God, we are cursed. This isn't going to end well for any of us. And that's the point. That's the point. It was all designed to point to the need for a Savior, right? And so, so Paul states this. Uh, Miss the law on one point, and we're all in big trouble. He quotes from Deuteronomy 27 to, to prove that. He quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, in verse 11 of our text. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Why? For the righteous shall live by faith. So uh, the, the proof is in the pudding. Those who are truly righteous are, are righteous and are living their lives according to a faith, trust, belief in God. That's how they're living. Uh, you probably often heard it said, when we get to heaven, God's going to put up the big screen and he's going to flash all of our dirty works across the screen and and we'll be shamed. So you don't want to live in such a way that's going to shame your God or shame your Savior or leave you embarrassed when you get there. Uh, I don't see that in Scripture. You know, if anything, maybe God will throw up the screen and say, you know what, in that area of their life, that's where I was working my grace there. And that's where, I, that's where they were trusting me there. And that's where they came to the end of themselves there. And they turned and they trusted me there. You see? The righteous live by faith. This is how we proceed our way through life quotes from Habakkuk to, to talk about that. He quotes from Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5 and verse 12. It says, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them, does these laws, they live by them. In other words, what do they get from it? A frustrated life that ends in a curse. Paul's point again that needs to, to really soak in for us if we are trying to get on God's good side, to merit his favor, it's not going to work. Okay? If we're trying to do that through our works of righteousness, it's not going to work. It didn't work for Abraham, it didn't work for the Galatians, it didn't work for the Judaizers, and it won't work for us. And you know what, it's not going to work for anyone that we try to minister to in Springfield either. So as we share the gospel, we share the gospel, the content of the gospel, as we share our testimony, we talk about these deep-seated theological truths of the gospel, that you know what, this is not dependent on anything that I can do, that you can do, that any of us can do. This is dependent solely on what Jesus has done. And God said, I trust him, I believe it. And they say, what, that said. That's it. See, well, that's too easy. There's got to be something I need to do. There's nothing I need to do. Except believe. That's it. So in sharing our story, to share the story, right? the story, that, you know, whatever my experience, I tie it to Jesus. He did what I couldn't do. He lived a sinless life. He kept the law perfect. He fulfilled it. 
and that qualified him to go to a cross to take my punishment for my sin so that I could be with him. See? And this is where Paul goes next. So this gospel, it's not new. It's not new. It's as old as Abraham. It's that. Actually, you can go back even further. It's as old as Adam. Because even in the garden, what did God do? He preached the gospel to Adam. The serpent will bruise the heel of the woman's seed. But the woman's seed will crush his head. It's the gospel, right? In the book of Genesis. Okay. So, not old, or not new. Not new, okay? Uh, this gospel is not new. And then, number two, let's talk about this. This gospel never gets old. Never gets old. Okay? It shouldn't get old. It never gets old. So, the final two verses here, they kind of speak for themselves. But we'll, we'll get some commentary here. So the mode of redemption is truly remarkable. This is verse 13. Let's read it. For Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And we know the reference there is to... Jesus being hanged on the cross, right? He was crucified. So crucified there as a criminal. He's cursed. That's how people viewed him. Okay? And so he is there as one deserving of punishment. Okay? That's, that's where they put criminals. Punish them there. So it says that uh, Christ redeemed us from this curse by becoming a curse for us. The word redeem is to purchase, to buy up, or to pay a price to set something free. And so the idea of a captive or uh, someone who is held hostage for a, the, the, the ransom price, you pay, you pay the fee and the person is released. This is the idea of being redeemed. And it says here uh, that Jesus is the one who redeemed. So because we are lawbreakers, we have violated God's holy standard, whether it be laws of Moses or just general moral law of God, like we fall short of his glory. Okay, so we are guilty, right? We are wrongdoers. We are sinners. So because of that, there is this price on our head. There is a payment that has to be made in order to secure our freedom. Don't pay the price. You are under condemnation, deserving of punishment. Now that's what the scripture teaches. Okay? So, Jesus comes and he pays this price for us. And what's interesting is this price for our freedom is a very high price, right? So, just, just take me and my own sin. So, my own sin and the totality of it, what would it take to earn my freedom? In other words, how much punishment would I need to endure? For God to say, it's enough, he can go free. What do you think? Say, well, he's not so bad. Yeah. I don't know, maybe three, four years? Well, I, I know what he did last week. Let's add another year. Like five years? So, so five years of punishment uh, in hell, and that'll be sufficient for him to go free? Now you read the scripture, the soul that sinned, it shall die, it shall be separated from God. And the, the wording in scripture is how long? Eternity. So forever is not long enough for the price to be paid sufficiently for me to go free. You get that? <laughs> it's not long enough. But here. Paul says, Christ redeemed us. Christ paid the price sufficiently so that we could be free. So what would take an eternity for me to pay? He paid. What would take an eternity for me to bear and endure? He bore and endured on the cross when he suffered there for me. You see? Can we do a little bit of math? Because this helps me. This helps me. Okay? Um, I'm one person, right? We've been talking about me, one person. So let's just, 
for easy math. Let's just say it would take 10 years of suffering, punishment, to, to pay the price so that I can be set free. So 10 years of this, of God's wrath on my sin, on me. And then I'm free, right? For 10 years, that's just me. So what if there were 10? I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, almost 10 over here. We had Roger here in this group. So this group of 10, okay? So for me, it would take 10 years. Let's say for all of you, it would each take 10 years. You know, maybe, maybe for Drake, maybe we'll bump him to 15 or something like that. <laughs> Let's just say 10, okay? So 10 years times 10 people, we can do that math easily, right? How many years do we have? It would take 100 years. You see where we're going with this? So it would take 100 years of God pouring his wrath out on these individuals for their sin, for him to say, okay, it's enough, that they can be set free. Just these 10. Want to keep going? Let's bump it to 100. So 100 people times 10 years is 1,000 years. So 1,000 years will be sufficient for me to say, okay, uh, that's, that's, that's enough. You can be free. You can be free. A thousand people, ten years each, it's ten thousand years worth of punishment. I think there are what, 300, 350 million people in the United States? We'll do the 300 because that's easy math, right? 300 million people times ten years each, just ten years? live a lot longer than that. That's three billion years worth of punishment. How many people are in the world? Seven point some billion. I got seven billion. Seven billion people times just ten years each. Seventy billion years. And that's not enough. It's not enough. But God sends his son Jesus. And the one who knew no sin, the one who was not cursed himself, became sin, became a curse, and thus endured the wrath of God, 70 billion years worth of it and more, So God would say, it's enough. Now those who place their faith and trust in you can be free. Wow. You see why this never gets old? This does not get old, folks. When, when this really sinks in, and we get this, and we don't ever fully get it, but when we get it, and we get it more, 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 and we get it more it's like, this never gets old. This is truly, truly amazing. Right? And so, it is, it is this gospel. That this is what needs to rise from our testimony as we share it. Like, apart from Jesus, this is my lot. Because of him, I am free. See? Never gets old. Never gets old. So, the mode of redemption, truly remarkable. Jesus became a curse for us. The blessing of salvation that is, is absolutely possible because he did this. Verse 14, so that, he did this, so that in Christ Jesus, in other words, those who are in Christ Jesus, those who believe in Christ Jesus, place their faith in Christ Jesus, what he did so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, <laughs> yeah, he brings Abraham back in. Remember his audience, all these opponents are saying Judaism and law and like Abraham long before any of that existed. So that the blessing of Abraham might come to not just Jews, but Gentiles, anyone who believes, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So what God promised to Abraham wasn't just a Jewish thing. Remember, it was all nations here to be blessed. 
through this seed of Abraham, through Jesus. So what Abraham enjoyed, the Jews of Paul's day thought Gentiles could only enjoy to the degree that they conformed to Jewish ways. They needed to become like Abraham indeed, by works, bearing the mark he bore, demonstrating obedience as he demonstrated obedience, passing all of these tests of faith. Paul, pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus, verse 14, told these Gentiles that they need to become like Abraham, not in deed, but in faith. Why did Jesus die? Paul tells his readers why he died in verse 14. It was because of Jesus that God could credit righteousness to Abraham's account. Uh, I think it's uh, Romans 5, 4, 5, that also speaks to this. How could Abraham go free? You think about that? How did Isaac get to go free? Be reconciled to God. How about Jacob? Twelve sons of Jacob, others within the nation. How does anyone go free? Because there's one who died. So Jesus doesn't die. Jesus doesn't die and not only take upon him the sins of those existing in his day, but he also took upon him the sins that now exist in our day, right? But he also took upon him the sins that existed in Abraham's day. Because he took upon him the sins that existed in Abraham today and paid for that sin sufficiently, that is why Abraham could be saved. That is why God can still be just. There has to be a payment for Abraham's sin. Right? There has to be. The soul that sins, it shall die. And one did die in his place. So God is still just. And the text says in Romans, he is not also the justifier. He is the one who declares that person righteous because of what happened through his son. You see? And so he says it here. In Christ, the blessing of Abraham comes to Gentiles as well, so that we receive this promised spirit through faith. It was because of Jesus that God could credit righteousness to the account of Abraham, to those in Galatia, Abraham looked forward to this with faith, with, with somewhat clouded glasses, but they look back having very clear vision to the one who was recently crucified. And so, again, this is the theological mooring to which Abraham and these believers could, could both anchor themselves. Not their experience, some nebulous, well, I just kind of believe, trusted God, you know, and it's like the deeper seated truth is for Abraham, there's one coming. And I believe that God says our salvation is going to be through that one who comes. The Galatians, one came. I believe through the one who came. You see? This is how they were saved. And so uh, this salvation is possible. It's possible for Abraham, for those in Galatia, for those that we serve and minister to today. So for everyone in this room, salvation is possible. Salvation is possible. Always has been, always will be. Until Jesus returns, right? And so it's for this reason that this gospel never gets old. It's possible for all of us. And so as we think about even how we evangelize, you know, you meet people on the street and you say, some people you meet and you think, oh, it's possible. This person, you know, maybe will listen and their life isn't totally in the trash. You know, they, they live somewhat morally and have a good reputation in the community and you know, they keep a job and you know, maybe I can have a conversation with them. They seem intelligent enough and we could talk about these things and maybe God will work in their heart and they come to faith in Christ. What, what about the, the homeless guy in the corner who's drunk, begging for money? about him. What do you think? He can be saved too. Because <laughs> God took his sin too. Right? Jesus bore it. And God said, it's enough. It's enough. <coughs> well, he's not, <laughs> you know, he's not a churchy kind. 
You heard him talk. You heard the mouth that he's got on. And what he did. What he continues to do daily. What if, what if people like that walked through our door and sat in the service? We'd rejoice that they're here, right? We, we, we would. Would we believe that God could save them? He could. He could. He chooses to do so, right? That's comfortable here, right? Because we get all this. What about out there? When we run into them on the street. Now I'm uneasy. I'm out of my, I'm out of my zone here. I'm out of my church zone. Um, you know, the same God that saved Abraham by faith, grace alone, right? God still didn't have to do anything for Abraham. Even though Abraham believed God didn't have to do anything. He did. It's grace. Same God that saved him. Same God that saved the Galatians. Same God that saved us. Could save anybody. Salvation is possible. Why? Because there's one who died. There's one who took all of the punishment that any of us deserve for our sin. Efficiently. Efficiently. I said it's enough. And the proof is in that if it's enough is that Jesus rose again. He's alive. And he's seated now at God's right hand, interceding for us. So anyone who comes and says, you know what, that person deserves that, that Jesus. Says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's enough. You see? <laughs> Hello, you know. He's enough. He's paid it all. Paul, sharing this news with the, those in Galatia who theologically were drifting, they were kind of being pulled by those in their day, says, Come back to your moorings. <laughs> Come back to the story. The deep seated truth of the story. There's one who died and rose again, and he is not. It's faith in him alone. And so this ancient gospel is presently amazing. <laughs> presently amazing. Is that how you see it? That's how we should see it. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you, God, for what we read in this text from the Apostle Paul. Thank you for these truths of the gospel. These deep-seated truths that are so precious. God, as we share our story, as we uh, interact with others, as we talk to people about the amazing things you've done in our life, may we not neglect to include in that Jesus. <laughs> For it is only through him that we are saved. And so we thank you and we praise you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to close our service here in a moment. But before we do, let's just bow our heads, close our eyes, and take some time to pray. Maybe God's working in your heart. And you can say, you know what? I, I'm just going to rejoice again. Thank God again for his work in me, that he has graciously shown kindness to me. I'm going to thank him again for sending his son to die for me. I'm just going to rejoice take a moment to do that. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what? I didn't realize it before, but I'm realizing it more now, that I really need Jesus. I don't have him in my heart and life. I've never trusted him. But if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just throw up your hand and, and pull it right back down. I'll see you and uh, we'll talk. We'll talk. And uh, talk with you more about how you can know Jesus as your Savior and be forgiven of your sins love to have that conversation with you. So let's take time to pray in a moment, and then Jason will come and close us.
Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for the message of the cross, the message of the good news of Jesus. And I ask that you would, um, as the word was so faithfully preached this morning, that it will abide in us, take root, that we would grasp and take hold of the gospel and preach to ourselves every day as our very lifeblood, that we live by faith in Christ alone. Oh, Father, your gospel is amazing, and we can't do anything for our salvation, and for that we truly praise you with all of our being. Help us to live gratefully, graciously, and with love each and every day of our lives to honor our Savior. May you be blessed today in Jesus' name. Amen.